So as, uh, as some of you know, in order to keep my licensing up to date, I have to do two classes, at least two classes a year. So I choose to do those in the spring and the fall because the summer is just too hard. Now there are some classes where I, uh, I'm like, I am ready to dig in. Last year we did polity and administration, which was amazing because it helped me realize different things about how I lead. This semester, however, and I don't, and, and I'm not saying this in a way to demean the class, but this semester we are, the class I signed up for is about the early church. I need a bigger shovel. Because I tell you, I, I understand why we are taking it, but the books, <laughs> the books, the reading, oh my gosh, is, is tough. But, it, but it, it, it comes together because in our class, one of the things that stuck out to me this past uh, weekend or yesterday was they talked about somebody whose name was Justin Martyr. In 150, year 150, he wrote a passage, and it's the first recorded written flow of worship. And it hasn't changed much. It talks about praise, it talks about greeting each other, uh, it talks about prayer. So it put in, per in perspective about what we do here is not so different than what they did in the year 150. It's all the other stuff that we're still trying to figure out. Let us pray. Lord, I ask you to be here, be with us, let your spirit flow however you see fit. I ask you to continue to be with the rest of the service. Uh, allow the words that, that I speak be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I want to tell you about uh, what happened with the bishop. Our service was supposed to start at 11.15, and it's funny because <clears throat> we're, we're sitting there and uh, the person on the piano is trying to kill time because it goes 11.15, 11.20, so he's playing different music because the bishop wasn't there. And I'm thinking to myself, I feel right at home. Because I have no idea what's going to happen at a church service these days. And you got to learn how to go with it. If you don't, you're going to drive yourself crazy. But anyhow, the, uh, the gentleman who was leading the singing, he gets up and, I, and he says, I, I want to let you all know, as you can see, all the important people in the front pews are not here because they're trying to figure out where the bishop is. <laughs> So we find out once he gets there, he starts preaching, he explains what happened. He says, uh, my wife and I were at home, the carbon monoxide detector went off, we had to call the fire department. The fire department came out, did a reading, and they said, your, your reading is too high, it's too dangerous, you need to not be here. So they had to go to a hotel. Checking in at 4 a.m., um, getting settled in, I'm sure. And then he had to be at the University of Indianapolis at 11.15 or a little earlier for service. So he, he goes on to tell us that, um, to tell you a little bit about why this is important. When we go to class, we park on the other side of campus. So we walk from where we have class over to the church. So, the bishop comes to the church. He sees two cars. And he says, they must be having it at the chapel at the University of Indianapolis. So he goes down there, he looks, there's nobody down there either. So he comes back to the church, 
And he said, by the time he pulled up, there was a bunch of people outside looking for him to wave him down. So he comes in and, and, and he says, uh, the one thing that I would say that came from all this, that if I had a message to tell people, if you're going to go to church, go in the building. Amen. Because two cars don't mean anything. But that was, that was as he went into a sermon, he, the positivity, like I said, the, here, here is, here is a, and I, believe me, I don't want to make it seem like I'm putting him on a pedestal. He would never want that. But as somebody who has to preach, you have somebody who had to deal with the fire department, checking in at 4 a.m. to a hotel, to trying to deliver an inspiring message within eight hours, probably. And he still had such a positive attitude about it. And I was thinking about the scripture from today, and it's because I don't think we really know how to look for God in the places that we are sometimes. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. The scripture is from, from Mark. <clears throat> Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain where they were alone. He was transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus. Peter reacted to all this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it is a good thing that we're here. Let's make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this, this because he didn't know how to respond. For the three of them were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice spoke from the cloud, This is my son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except for Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the human one had risen from the dead. So this is kind of when the light bulb goes off that Jesus is not only human, but he's divine as well. And they see Jesus in a different way. So my question to all of us today is, are we the same people that we were a year ago? Did we grow? Did we change? Did our philosophy change? Did Jesus mean something different than what it did before? I was talking, I used a few examples. The first time that I went to church with my mom, we had communion. And some of you know this story. They were talking about, they were going to the communion reading, and they were talking about the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. Let this be the body and the blood. And I'm thinking in my, mom, in my mind, what did my mom get me into? When you're a first timer and you hear body and blood, it can make you go, what are we doing here? Obviously, it's one of the most special things that I'm able to partake in now because my attitude and my knowledge has changed over the years. We talk all the time about how you can read a scripture. It could even be a week between. You could read one on a Saturday or read the same one next Saturday and get something completely different out of it. And it's because God was with you. And he worked with you. You just didn't see him. So it made me think about how many times that we have all these things happen that, that God is with us, 
but we're just too blind and busy and preoccupied to see. Like the three disciples, when they actually saw Jesus, they were afraid. Can't say I blame them. First off, who wants to, we all know that God loves us. But you come face to face with him, I tell you what, your life takes a different spin on things. Because now you have to go face to face with your Savior and you have to understand how much you can do better. So my, my, my point to all this is this season that's coming up, Flint, we have Ash Wednesday, Monday to Thursday, Good Friday, all, all of the services where we can, we can experience God. And Joyce mentioned reflecting. That's what I want us to do over this season, is to reflect. Ask God, I want to see how you're working in my life. And if I need to go a different direction, I need you to guide me there. And it has to be sincere. Because if we say it just to say it, we'll never have that fire. We'll never have that experience with God. You have to be brutally honest with yourself when you ask for that, because God will have a way of saying, you have a lot of work to do. I love you. How many of us parents have said that to kids? I love you, but man, you got a lot of work to do. And I think that's what he would tell all of us. That we have, we have things to do in the future. That's one reason why, for me, I talk so much about the leadership with the bishop and Marty, because they don't want to hear about yesterday. They don't want to hear about how it was. They want to know what you're doing. Where are you going? How are you making disciples? Not how you made disciples. Not the program you used to. But how are you making disciples tomorrow, Tuesday, next Sunday? And I think that's the reflection that we need to do with, with the desire to have that mountaintop experience like the three disciples of being able to say, I saw God, I feel like this is where he needs me to go. Whether it's individually or it's a church. Now I wanted to ask about the church meeting because I wanted to make sure when I mentioned it, here's what we're going to do. Every day, I start work at 9. So we'll say 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock work for all of you. Everybody kind of free about 9 o'clock? 9 o'clock, we're going to pray for this church. And we're going to pray to have a vision. Now I'm not, I'm, I don't want you to take that out of context. I'm not talking about a vision where you, you have an encounter. I'm talking about something that's in your heart, a vision from your heart and your mind about where we can go. Nine o'clock, every day this week, we're gonna pray for Griffin, Virgin Island Methodist Church. We're gonna play, pray for people that sit in these pews, not to be in these pews, to be out of these pews, figuring out how to move forward. And then on Sunday, if you have the smallest idea that you think this is stupid, nobody would ever buy this, still mention it. And here's something else that you need to remember, too. I am not going to say, guess what, Keith? I got the greatest idea that it's something you can do. 
That's not what this is about. What this is about is, I have an idea for our church, how we can reach out, and I want everybody to be involved in it from prayer to action. This time of year is a good time for us to figure out where we are and to understand why we're doing it. Because there, the reason is going to be right in our faces, folks. Talking and hearing scripture about how Jesus died for us. About how he defeated death and he will always be with us. Christmas is a great time for us to remember how it got started. But these few weeks are an amazing time for us to remember and ask ourselves, what are we going to do because of the story that we're hearing? Look for God. Look for God in the small places. One of the most touching things that I've ever had happen to me was as we were praying in camp, I had a youth come up to me and ask me if he, if he could talk to me out in the auditorium or in the little uh, common area. So we go out there and I said, what can I do for you? What, what is, what's on your mind? And he said, I wanted to pray for you. This is a 14 year old kid or whatever age he was that got it. He felt something here and he put it into action. Those are the kind of things that we need to look for and remember as we go through these next few weeks. The song that I, I picked for today it's actually called uh, All Things New. And I thought it was kind of fitting because I think at this point, this is the best time for us to be able to put that stuff behind us that's holding us back, that is making us scared, that is a common phrase that we can't do that because. Those things we need to let go of. So I hope this song uh, helps you uh, center your mind. <laughs> 